Psalm 37, 1 through 11. And the title of the session is Resting in God. There are a few themes that will become evident, and I should mention that there are a few verses in this passage that you probably know quite well. For example, verse 3 of the chapter says, Trust in the Lord and do good, and dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Verse 4, well known, Delight yourself in the Lord, King James Version says. He will give you the desires of your heart. Verse 25 says the King David, the older King David saying, I was young, now am I old, yet have I never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. The first verse says, do not fret. How many of us fret? How, many, how do you even define fret? What is fretting? Someone said that fretting is becoming angry and envious at the same time. There's something that's causing you to be angry and you're envying the fact that other people are doing things they ought not to be doing and they don't seem to be having any consequences, detrimental consequences, and you fret. There are other reasons to fret as well, but that's one of the better definitions I've come across. So what I'm going to do is to read scripture and then read the session outline. Hopefully you have it close by. But I'll start with Psalm 37, verses 1 through 11. If you have your Bible handy, I'm reading from the New International Version. And the subtitle in my Bible is, The Heritage of the Righteous and the Calamity of the Wicked. We're told that it's a psalm of David, and it's the older king writing the psalm. I should tell you that one of the features of this psalm is that it's an acrostic psalm. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. There are 40 verses. 22 doesn't quite go into 40, but with a little bit of interesting arrangement, we'll see that this does fit the Hebrew alphabet. I'm no Hebrew scholar, and I'm trying to give the impression that I understand how this is set out using the alphabet, and hopefully that will become clearer as we move along, but even if it doesn't, I do not think that the knowledge that's a alphabetic or acrostic psalm pre presents any other insights. It presents more challenges for us, but if you didn't know that, I don't think that you would be at a great loss. In fact, I wonder how many people knew this was an acrostic psalm. I'm reading Psalm 37 verses 1 through 11. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious for those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. And there's a colon there. Here's what he's going to do. Verse 6. Let me read verse 5 once more. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. And this is what he will do. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. Verse 11, but the meek will inherit their, the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. On the handout, I've provided the entire chapter and you'll recognize that some of the themes mentioned in the first 11 verses come up again and again, for example, the whole idea of the wicked and their end comes up perpetually and the righteous and their outcomes as well. Back to the session in context, I'm reading Resting in God. Psalm 37 is arranged as an alphabet acrostic, which employs two lines of verse, which together make complete sense. In the original language, each couplet begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. The 11 verses that we are looking at this week cover the first six letters of the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, He, and Vav. 
There are two verses for each letter, except in verse 7, where there are four lines already. So verse 7 is kind of like two verses. And I mentioned that the versification of the Hebrew Bible came later than the writing of the psalm. The simple pointed command in this passage, fret not, appears in three different places in the psalm, verse 1, verse 7, and verse 8. The psalm reminds us that we are patiently to wait, trust, and not worry. This advice sounds easy until we face injustices, inequalities, and frustrations that are experienced by so many, so much of the time. But our confidence is to be in the long-range, kindly providences of our love in God. We've already read the scripture passage, so I'm going to focus on the first question, which focuses on verse 1. Verse 1 sets the tone that dominates the psalm. And the question I ask is, what command is given in verse 1? It says, do not fret. Do not be envious. Do not fret because of evildoers. Do not be envious of those who are doing wrong. Verse 2 tells us their outcome. They will soon wither, they will soon die away. Again, there's a lot of poetry in the psalm that we will miss if we don't recognize that it's a poetic, acrostic psalm. And clearly the writer took pains to make sure that he or she, he in this case, got it right. But we believe that the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the psalm. So I asked a question about the word fret, and I looked at other translations and they use words such as worry, get upset, be angry, agitated, preoccupied. So the synonyms for fretting are worry, upset, angry, agitated, preoccupied. The command is given not to fret and not to worry. Back in the Caribbean, we would quote a Bob Marley song which says, don't worry because everything is going to be all right. And there's so many other songs that focus on this idea of not worrying. Why worry when you can pray? Trust Jesus, he will lead the way. Another one that comes to mind. And we also remember the words of our Lord in Psalm, sorry, in Matthew chapter five, in the be happy attitudes, the be attitudes, where basically the be attitudes are saying, do not worry. Do not worry, but trust in God. Question number two says, how would you define envy? And to which of the commandments is it related? Verse 1 says, don't be envious. So we're asking, how, you, how would you define envy? This is a personal pet peeve of mine that I made a distinction being taught that there's a difference between envy and jealousy. Envy is related to things and jealousy is related to persons. We become jealous if someone is trying to take away our love object. We become envious when people have things that we don't have or we desire. So envy relates to things and jealousy relates to people. It reminds me of a B.J. Thomas song that said, using things and loving people, that's the way it's meant to be. You probably don't know the song, hopefully everyone, most of you know who B.J. Thomas was. The next line said, using things and loving people, look around and you will see that loving things and using people only leads to misery. Using things and loving people, that's the way it's meant to be for you and me. Lovely song, taking me back to the early 70s. B.J. Thomas, Using Things. Okay, to which of the commandments is it related? The 10th commandment in our representation says, Thou shalt not covet the things that your neighbors have, the things that others have. So coveting and being envious go together. Question number three, in what ways are we tempted to be envious of others whose ways are not godly? Certainly when we see people who are not doing right, succeeding, we can feel like they are getting something they don't deserve. And we want some of what they are getting if it's part of our own desire set and they are succeeding at what we are striving after, but they're succeeding by not doing the ethical things, then we can become envious, especially when we feel as though it's not our place to complain and rat on them for achieving to get their way. 
question number four. Look at verses three through five, and the question asks, what are the imperatives listed in verses three through five? Trust in the Lord. Imperative means it's more of a command. Trust in the Lord. Do good. Dwell in the land. Enjoy safe pasture. Just because you dwell doesn't mean you will enjoy unless the land is so secure that there's no way for the dwelling to lead to anything other than safe pasture. So the command there is to dwell in the land, but that needs to be unpackaged a little. How can dwelling in the land be a command? Can someone command you to do good for yourself? Or can they command you to do something that leads to good? The next real command is in verse 4, take delight in the Lord, as, or as the King James Version says, delight in the Lord. But can someone command you to delight? I say you can pull a string, you can't push it. And someone commanding you to take delight is interesting, it's commanding you to be happy. Be happy. <laughs> you can tell me to be happy, but that doesn't make me happy. You can do something that would cause me to be sad, but you can easily enforce happiness. Take delight in the Lord. This command does give us a promise. He will give you the desires of your heart. And there's been, in my experience, not controversy, but alternative interpretations of this verse. And I've heard people say that it means that he will give you the desire. He will replace the desire in you to be the desire that you ought to have. If you trust in him, he will do that heart transplant, give you the desires of your heart. Sort of like David saying in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. So I had never thought of that before, but I think it works here. If you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give to you the desires of your heart. It is not prosperity. At least I don't interpret it as prosperity. Some translations do say he will prosper. And even in verse 11, the last verse that we're looking at today, it says, the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. So the same idea comes in verse 3 as in verse 11, again needing some unpackaging. Remember that the old king is writing based on his life experiences and telling those who are listening, let's say one of his sons, if you do write that God will straighten your paths. Or as Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, trust in the Lord and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will straighten your paths so that you don't have to go on this crooked alternative. And finally, verse 5. The question we're answering is question number 4. The imperative is listed in verses 3 through 5. And verse 5 says, commit your way to the Lord. Trusting in him comes back again. And verses 5 and 6 clearly belong together because the punctuation at the end of verse 5 is not a period. It's a colon. Trust in him and this is what he will do. Make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. And I've read somewhere where it says that the way the sun shines at dawn is different than the way the sun shines at noonday. So that it's an intensifying of what he will do for you. He will make your righteous reward because you trust in him. The righteous reward that you will obtain will shine in the dawn. And your vindication. Vindication. When I think of vindicate, I think of winning. The V-I-N reminds me of W-I-N. And in a form of indication is winning or being determined that you were right in the first place, your rightness. So he'll make your righteousness shine like the dawn, your rightness, your correctness, your right behavior, and the results of that, like the noonday sun. So there is a reinforcement of the idea that you're seeking to do what is in God's will will lead to a reward that God will direct your paths, prosper you, however you want to interpret it, again, in a spiritual sense. But I want to focus on verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. I was communicating with someone who mentioned a book to me, and the author of the book 
suggested that the commands given here are to be more of a pattern for how we organize our life. Trust in the Lord, verse 3. Take delight in the Lord. Commit our way to the Lord. And then I came across the interpretation of what committing your way to the Lord actually means. Because in the order of becoming a Christian and devoting yourself, yourself to God, you would first commit to Him and then trust Him because trust is more of a contract a commit is more of an action. I commit. So if you were to use a marital relation analogy here, when you say the vows, you're committing to love and cherish and honor and obey and whatever else it says. And uh, till death us do part. Whatever version you would appreciate of that. And then you trust. You trust that the person will have your best interest at heart. And the relationship will grow from strength to strength. You're trusting for this better outcome. Taking delight, again, I'm stretching it here with the relationship analogy, but the relationship should bring you some delight and uh, fulfillment. If the relationship is not doing that for you, then clearly something is wrong. So the idea here is that based on the other reference I was looking at, committing trusting and taking delight but when you look at verse 5 you get a totally different sense because one it comes after verses 3 and 4 after trusting and taking delight in the Lord then the author says commit to the Lord commit your way to the Lord and here's what that actually means roll your burdens on the Lord all your anxieties, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. Never a burden he cannot bear, never a friend like Jesus. Take delight in the Lord, trust in the Lord, commit your way to the Lord. Whatever burdens come your way, whatever trials come your way, as you delight in him, you feel as though I can just give it all to Jesus and he will turn your sorrows into joy. I think the song is by the Peterson sisters. Are you tired of chasing rainbows? I don't remember exactly how it goes. Tired of going round and round? At the feet of Jesus, lay them down. Your burdens. Give it all to Jesus and he will turn your sorrow into joy. So that's the idea in verse 5. Committing your way to the Lord is giving him, giving him all your anxieties and all your cares. Commit your way to the Lord. Roll your burdens unto him. And I thought of the song, an old chorus that said, Roll, roll your burdens away. Roll, roll your burdens away. Roll, roll your burdens away. For Jesus has promised to take them away. Roll, roll your burdens away. And you can probably think of many other songs with the word roll in them. Some available in your hymnal, songbook. And... Uh, a few come to my mind right now, but I think the idea is transmitted. So verse 5, commit your way to the Lord, roll your burdens on the Lord, and trust in him. So the trust in verse 3 comes back in verse 5. Trust in him and roll your burdens on him. And there's a promise in verse 6. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn. He will make your vindication like the noonday sun. That's a good promise. Trust in the Lord. Take delight in the Lord. And roll your burdens on the Lord or commit to the Lord. So that takes care of question number five. What does trusting in the Lord look like in your life? Well, it's sort of trusting in the Lord. For me, trusting in the Lord means that I'm waiting and hoping, scriptural hope, believing that he will actually part my Red Sea and he will help me to cross the Jordan River and again the words of verse 25 come to my mind I was young now am I old and yet have I never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread that is the comfort that I was given as a child that verse 25 of Psalm 37 is basically saying if you trust in the Lord he will make your righteous reward like the dawn and your vindication like the noonday sun. Quite a good promise. For, so for me, trusting in the Lord means just waiting on him. 
Isaiah says in chapter 40, for those who wait on the Lord. Chapter 40, I should look it up, right? For they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I'm actually going to go and use my computer skills and verify what I should have known, what I used to know. And we'll see Isaiah 40. I think it's Isaiah 40, the last verse in Isaiah 40. A little embarrassed, <laughs> but that's all right. It was a little slip up among friends, right? And uh, it says, comfort my people, first verse. And the last verse says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. That's the NIV. So we have a sense as to where this is going. Let's get back to the Sunday school lesson. So I said that trusting in the Lord for me is waiting on God and hoping and believing. One song says trusting is believing that God will keep his word. Trusting is believing that God will keep his word. That's probably not the right tune, but you get the idea. Trusting is believing that God will keep his word. That all of my cries to him will be heard. Again, I wish I remembered the song. I could look it up, but that would only slow up the lesson a little bit more. Question number six. How might we take delight in the Lord? How will doing that, taking delight in the Lord, impact the desires of our hearts? So one of the things I wanted to do in this entire session was to look at many translations to make sure that things were lost in translation because when you think about the fact that committing your way to the Lord was just mind-boggling to think it meant rolling your burdens on him I don't want to miss anything else lost in translation so let's go back to question number six how might we take delight in the Lord how might you take delight in the Lord I was communicating with a friend today I don't want to say that it was taxing <laughs> But my friend just kept sending these text messages and asking these difficult, difficult questions to which I didn't know the answers. And I said to him, is there some schadenfreude going on here? Are you getting satisfaction out of me not knowing the answers to these questions? To which he responded, no, I actually like it when not only do you give me an answer that surprises me, but you teach me something in the process. For the sake of the friendship, I'm going to trust <laughs> that what he is saying is correct. So, how do I take delight in the Lord? I tell you, studying the Bible is my way of taking delight in the Lord. And some of you who know me might know that singing. Singing psalms, hymns, scriptural words also is my way of delighting in the Lord. How will doing this impact the desires of my heart? Sometimes... When I feel like fretting, I get redirected. When I start to sing songs that comfort me, that cause me to look at my situation and realize that I actually have not only a good life, but the blessings of God, that he is not giving me what I want, but he is meeting my needs. And having the comfort of that is all I want. Sometimes I think of the fact that my life right now is very different than the life I was growing up and experiencing. Very, very different. And even though I long for that old life, I know I can never get back to that point because we've moved on. The world has changed and it's been a long time now. But my desires now are different than my desires when I was younger. I think I lost the point there. But delighting in the Lord. And sometimes delighting in the Lord can change as we grow older. For example, if I delighted in the Lord by doing certain things that I can no longer do, then I have to find new ways to delight in the Lord. Or as I grow closer to Him, I can delight him in Him in ways that I didn't delight in Him in the past because I didn't have those experiences. For example, when I was younger, before I got married, there's some ways that I delighted in the Lord. And then I had children... <laughs> and that changed the way I delighted in the Lord somewhat. Got married and had children. And I look forward to 
the empty nest phase, which means I'm going to be older and closer to my maker, delighting in the Lord. And as you grow older, with less time left on the clock, so to speak, I'm sure that anticipating heaven brings a different delight than when you're toiling with the world world of work and the strife and the struggles. Retirement brings different delight than working. Sometimes we rationalize and we say we're delighting in what we're doing, but we are really enduring it. So we are trying to deal with the noise in our heads, the cognitive dissonance. So we rationalize and say we like things or things give us delight. And that's how you can change your own desire. For example, you might not really enjoy doing something initially, but as you grow, you might become better at it and learn to appreciate it more. I've been trying to exercise, I call it exercise, the past few weeks, and uh, now I can run. I used to run in the past and I forgot how to run. Now I can run again, and I feel good about that. The muscles are accustomed now to that form of exercise and that's a good thing back to the lesson of course hmm. let's go on to question number seven rather than fret when the wicked seem to succeed we are called to be still and wait let's read verse seven be still before the lord and wait patiently for him do not fret when people succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes this is almost a repeat of verse one do not fret because of those who are evil and be envious of those who do wrong. Do not fret when people succeed when they carry out their wicked schemes. So we see evil and we see wicked. And I'm putting them as synonyms here. Evil and wicked. Wicked is clearly an adjective and evil is a noun, but I think the idea is the same. So let's go back to the question number seven. Rather than fret when the wicked seem to succeed, we are called to be still and wait. In other translations, interestingly, use the word rest for be still. To rest or to be patient or to quiet your heart or to be silent. Rest. Rest in the Lord. I thought of the French word rest day to stay. Just stay. Be still. Be quiet. Slow down. Rather than fret, calm yourself down. So the calming is a way of combating the fretting. It's like changing your mindset, the log jam of negative and upsetting thoughts being replaced when you be still. Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. I don't want to sound new age-ish, but new age-ish, is that even a word? Of a new age variety. But just calming yourself down and being still. I used to tell my children when they got really anxious and upset to close their eyes. They'd be crying and frustrating themselves and frustrating others. And I say, if you close your eyes, I think that the stress will be less because your eyes are not engaging your surroundings and adding to the stress so close your eyes and i thought that closing your eyes helps with your breathing you can break that rapid breathing cycle by closing your eyes because the things that the external stimuli the visual stimuli are gone and some other stimuli are there but you just be still calm the noise down so I think that, sticking to that, to that analogy for a moment, closing your eyes reduces the stimulation. Being quiet reduces the stimulation. Settling your mind. That will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. So being still, be still for the presence of the Lord is in this place. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. You can think of other scriptures that refer to being still, and I think they will work here. We are called not to fret. Rather than fret at the wicked succeeding, close your eyes. Take your focus off the world and the things of the world and set your gaze on Jesus and what he has done for us and what it means for eternity. 
take your eyes off the present and put your eyes on the future. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Not quite the perfect analogy, but regazing or averting our gaze from one thing and onto something else. Gazing at Jesus, gazing at the cross, gazing at the mercy seat, gazing at what we have committed to. Again, trust in the Lord, delighting in the Lord, rolling your burdens on the Lord, not fretting. Be still before the Lord. Good four point sermon if you wanted one there. Trust in the Lord, delight yourself in the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord, and be still and wait on the Lord. For they that wait shall have their strength renewed. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Let's go back to the Sunday school lesson and the passage. Let's look at the last verse, verse 11. It says, the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. I'm not exactly sure where to go with that. Part of the reason I'm not sure where to go with it is because it says the meek will enjoy, will inherit, and then enjoy peace and prosperity. And it raises the question, how do we define meek? Who are the meek? Who are the meek being referred to in this verse? The old king is writing, let's say, to his son and saying, don't fret, the meek will inherit the land. And he also mentions in verse, inheritance. Where is that? Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. And the word inherit comes up in verse 9 again. Those who are evil will be destroyed. Those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. So verse 9 says, those who hope or trust in the Lord will inherit the land. And then verse 11 says, those who are meek will inherit the land. So the hoping and the meekness go together. Meekness is an interesting fruit. If you remember in the fruit of the spirit, King James Version, it says, love, joy. <laughs> Let me not mess this up. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, and temperance. So the eighth fruit mentioned, or number eight on the list, is meekness. And this is a fruit that the spirit ripens in us. So we don't start out being meek but the word meek has a lot of weak connotations meek weak and i've heard cliches don't let my meekness be taken for weakness the meek shall inherit the earth gentle jesus meek and mild lots of associations of not fighting back mm, so you think of gandhi probably not the greatest analogy to use martin luther king and more recently John Lewis, individuals who are meek, who want the right outcome, but they will choose the approach that is not violent or not reactionary, but they want to love you into the kingdom, turn in the other cheek idea. The meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. This sounds to me like eternity, that if we develop this fruit called meekness. If we allow the Holy Spirit to ripen that fruit in us, that we will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. I could say that King David is talking about Jerusalem and he's telling his son or whomever is the audience, his sons, he had so many. And anyway, you know, the challenges he had with one son trying to kill him, another son dealing with his sister's abuse and all kinds of interesting things. And then who will inherit the kingdom from the king when he passes on and Solomon is the child of a lady with whom he had an illicit affair. By then she was his wife, but still it's just a lot of baggage in David's family. Interesting that David was a man after God's own heart. Let's get back to the Sunday school lesson. So the question asks, who are the meek? In verse 11, how would you define meek? Let's go to question number nine. What does it mean for you that the meek will inherit the land? Again, I was trying to focus on the synonyms for meek and 
Other translations say weak, humble, oppressed, lowly, poor, afflicted, not proud. None of this sounds like it is fruit that we would desire. You wouldn't want to say that if I'm going to grow in meekness, that I want to grow in weakness. Except you think of the Apostle Paul, who says that God used his weakness to be strong. You know the verse, hopefully, I'm talking about in my weakness. I'm strong. When I am weak, then am I strong. Or when he said, he asked the Lord to remove the thorn in the flesh. And the Lord responded, my grace is sufficient because my power is perfected in your weakness. So maybe Paul needed, I say, to be humbleized from the more arrogant self he was when he was persecuting the Christians. Then he had that dramatic conversion. And then he went to the desert for a while, and then he became meek. So the arrogant Paul becomes the meek Paul, and the arrogant soul, I should say, becomes the meek Paul, and this is a good thing. So when we say, change my heart, O God, hopefully you have a sense of the song I'm thinking of. Change my heart, O God, make it be like you. Something along those lines. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Make it ever new, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God. But we're saying, change my heart so that my other otherness can become meekness. I can make myself meek before the Lord, knowing that, like he said to the Apostle Paul, my power is perfected in your meekness. Weakness, meekness. So again, the other translations say weak. So meekness is weakness. Humility, oppress, oppression, lowliness, poverty, affliction. How do we inherit? We'll go back to the Sermon on the Mount. And where we are told the last of the Beatitudes is, Be happy when they revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil things against you. Falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven because they've persecuted the prophets who were before you, Jesus telling his disciples this. But also, we know that the disciples were also going to get persecuted. And if these martyrs could pave a way for us as Christians, then we also need to say, well, gee, what is my contribution to the kingdom? Having the Lord just give me, give me, give me like a spoiled child asking for what we want, or saying, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after your will while I am waiting, yielded and still. Oh, to be like thee, lowly in spirit, holy and harmless, patient and brave, meekly enduring cruel reproaches, willing to suffer others to save. Heavenly Father, help us to be more like you. Make us more like you, Jesus. Give us a heart that's filled with love and make us more like you. Thank you for the promise in this lesson that the meek will inherit, both from the Beatitudes and the Psalm. Thank you for the wisdom in the Psalm not to fret, but to cast our gaze on you, to trust in you, to delight in you, to commit our way to you, to roll our burdens on you, and to be still before you. May this lesson penetrate our hearts and stay with us and help us to be stronger as we serve you, willing to suffer others to save. Help us to have that burning desire to see others come to salvation. Not to focus on our own self and our own stuff, but to recognize that in these difficult times, if ever there was a time we needed you, it is now. And if we feel that need for you, that others who don't know you certainly have a need for you, you'll give us the boldness to carry the gospel with a burning passion inside of us to share what you have done for us. May we take the charge, like the song says, gird on the armor and rush to the field, determined to conquer and never to yield. So the enemy shall know that we are fighting for you. Give us the boldness, give us the courage. 
Give us the blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you.